I need to begin with the obligatory disclaimer that I am not an expert on Israel. You are all experts on Israel. Um, but I want to do a somewhat deep dive into the Economic Freedom Index data that we have for Israel and highlight those elements of the index where Israel appears to be performing relatively poorly. Please don't take this as an attack. Every country, including my own, has parts of the index that they could do better on. Um, but I, I need to admit my own ignorance. I know 42 things. I have 42 numbers in my head. Well, they're not really in my head, but they're in my computer. I have 42 things I know about Israel. And that's not a lot. This is a very complicated country. Uh, to be an expert on, on Israel, you probably need to, new, need to know 4,200 things about Israel. Um, and I don't. I know 42. Now, I know 42 things about 165 countries, so I know a little bit about a lot of countries, but I don't know a lot about any country except perhaps the one I happen to live in. And, and if you live in a country, you'll, you'll get a deeper understanding. So this is going to be superficial, perhaps. But on the other hand, um, very few people on the planet know anything about Israel. And when they look at Israel, they're like me. And they're going to look at a very few things, including some of the things that we're going to talk about here. So from an outsider's point of view, it's actually good for you as an insider to get an idea of what outsiders see when they, when they look at Israel. Because we're not going to, no outsider is ever going to get the depth of knowledge that an Israeli has about Israel. Um, that'll be the first part. Now, I have a couple things at the end of the talk today, and that may be sort of somewhat dependent on time. But there's a couple pieces of research that are Israel specific and economic freedom specific. In other words, a couple pieces of hard academic research that about economic freedom in Israel that I think are important, one of which I wrote, and then another one was, was a paper written by a, a good friend of mine, Ben Powell. And so time permitting, we will maybe mention those two articles uh, at the end. So what does the data say about Israel? Well, I, we know a little bit already. Israel's, well, you know where it is. I don't point at it. So, but I, I zoomed in a little bit. Um, and as you remember from the other day, uh, Israel's score on the index overall is a 7.43. That currently ranks it 43rd out of the 165 countries. Uh, this is, you know, if you look in the region you're in, it's really quite diverse. You have several countries in the sort of, I don't know what, what, di what radius that is, uh, a couple thousand uh, miles or a few thousand kilometers. Um, uh, a couple countries are blue. Uh, Cyprus is 24th, so they're higher. I suspect that Cyprus is a comp competing economy uh, with Israel on some margins. Uh, in the South Caucasus, Georgia and Armenia score pretty high, as we mentioned earlier as well. Uh, and then Bulgaria is pretty high. Um, uh, you know, but then you also have, on the other end, most of the, uh, most of the Arab or Muslim world doesn't score very good in the, in the index. Uh, red countries in Libya, Egypt, uh, Syria, Iraq, Iran. Iran is 160 out of 165. So, you know, yeah. But, uh, Jordan is like two points higher than us, but still two places behind. Uh, that's a typo. It's probably supposed to be 7.39. That would be a pro probably, yeah, it's got to be a typo. I literally hand typed those in. So, uh, yeah, that's a typo. They are somewhat, the, the, but uh, in a statistical sense, we actually score Jordan and Israel about tied. I mean, these, you know, these data are not so precise that the difference between 7.4 and 7.5 or 7.3 is that, that big. Uh, so they're, they're pretty close to tied. I think there, there even have been years where Jordan may have been ahead of Israel, but most often Israel's just a notch above. Jordan's come way up. They've, you probably know they've liberalized their economy considerably over the last 20 years, uh, and they, we show them as being one of the upward movers. In, and that's a typo, though. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, uh, so, you know, you got a really mixed bag. You've got some very high economic freedom countries in your region and some very low ones. Some of the lowest, actually, in the whole world are near you. Uh, and their geopolitical rivals as well as, as economic rivals. Um, so it's, it's, it's quite a mixed bag. Now, <clears throat> let's take, the, let's take a, a, a long run view of the time series. Now, I, I pulled these data from my colleague Ryan Murphy, 
who I'm mad at this morning because he made a mistake and my publisher sent me a nasty note today and because uh, he made an error and I had to correct his error. So I'm angry at, at Ryan today. But Ryan is a pretty good care, uh, careful scholar most of the time. <laughs> and he, he's constructed what he thinks is the best time series of data. So this is unpublished work, but, I, but since he, he literally works in the office next door to me, I asked him to give me the, the, <clears throat> the latest numbers he had from his, from his newest paper. And this is, the, I think, the best big picture look at Israel, uh, the United States, just for comparison, and then the world average, also for comparison. Um, one of the challenges, and you'll see this in a minute, with the Economic Freedom Index is if you go backward in time, uh, so today we have 42 components, 42 variables. But if you go backward in time, we, we don't have 42 variables available in, say, 1980, and certainly 1970. So as you go back in time, you have fewer variables available. And this, begins, this creates a bit of a problem. If you want to focus in on one country over time, the index for Israel in 2019 is based on 42 numbers, but the one in 1980 is based perhaps on 30 numbers, and the one in, in uh, two, 1970 might be based on 27 numbers. So you've got an apples to oranges kind of problem. And so we have a, I'm not going to get into the math on this, but we have a way of, of massaging the data to make the, to make the time series consistent so that, those, that, so that the dropping out of variables as you go back in time is not actually influencing the time trend. Okay, so this is the best time trend that is available. That's a little technical, but it's important to say this is not exactly the same data that we publish in the report. This is data that we've published in the report, and then we've processed the data a second time to get a good, clean time series. So anyway, uh, <clears throat> if you look at the United States, the United States, and we actually have, he, he did it for his 50 data too. Remember I said we had some data back to 50? So we've got, we have uh, Israel and the United States in that set. So, you know, uh, more or less the beginning of, of the country of Israel. So uh, U.S. 7.59 ends up at 7.97, a general upward slope through the, uh, actually in the 70s, but into the 80s and, and 90s, and then around 2000, the U.S. begins to kind of uh, wiggle and kind of drift downward. And that's, I think, pretty, pretty fair representation of the, of, Israel, of the United States. The world average, though, starts out pretty low. The black number, black line, 4.99. It ends up at 6.75. So there's been a lot of global liberalization of economies. If you think about the economies of the 50s and 60s, we had a lot of hard socialist countries in the 50s and 60s. But we, even the ones that weren't socialist <clears throat> were uh, in the 50s and 60s. They, their monetary policy, we talked about last night, I mean, as bad as it is right now, believe me, it was much worse in the 50s and 60s in lots of countries. Uh, just as one data point, in 1970, 43 countries at inflation rates above 40% a year. Last, this year, I think that number is one country, Venezuela. Uh, so, I mean, as bad as our monetary world can be, and I, I'm, not a big, I'm not happy with our monetary system right now and where it's going, uh, trust me, it was much worse in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And so, uh, the, uh, another thing is trade policy, much worse in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and trade policy, uh, we have, the whole world has moved towards freer trade, lowering barriers between countries. Uh, so the world average is up, you know, over, over 2.7, 2 you know, two, almost three points. It's a huge increase in the global average. And, you know, interestingly, Israel's actually outperformed that. Israel, in 1950, we would score them about at the world average. And, and then uh, Israel kind of mimics, that's, so Israel's the blue line, I chose that because of the color of the flag, just FYI. Um, uh, and so the, the blue line, you know, it starts about the world average, but actually gets much worse than the world through the uh, 70s and 80s. And when I was a college student, I graduated high school in 1985. I graduated college in 1988 and graduate school in 1992. During my formative years, during the years in which I was like you, uh, Israel was a joke. It was a laughing stock. We made jokes about it. There were two countries in the world we made jokes about. New Zealand and Israel. We're like, oh, these, are, these, these countries should be better. They're just terrible. And, you know, as you know, uh, people, you know, you had out-migration. You had immigration, too, but you had a lot of Israelis. The brain drain in the 70s and 80s was huge. Um, one of my closest friends is a surgeon in the United States, but he 
he fought in the 73 or 4 war, which one, I don't know, he was a fighter pilot, and he, 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 got the, he, he fought this war, he got the hell out, went to medical school, and he's a great doctor now. Um, so Israel was a joke. So you can see that, that, that period where uh, Israel was, was, I mean, it actually got worse in the 70s and 80s. And then, wow, starting around, we, we score it right around mid-80s, this, this radical move beginning in, say, the late 80s into the 90s of, of radical liberalization of the Israeli economy. And I'll show you the details of that in a second. But that's the big picture story. The big narrative is Israel was a laughingstock uh, it, it, as an economy in terms of economic freedom and, and performance. And then some time along the way, they sort of saw the light. And, and now they actually outperform the world average. You can, you know, we saw that previously. They're, they're right on the cusp of that 25th percentile, um, or 75th percentile if you do it. Yeah. And the flash, the end is the glitch of Francis. Or... Yeah, so that's COVID. So I, this is the data from the fourth. You guys are, you guys are getting all the, 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 the early intel. Uh, I don't think you can trade on this information and make any money, though. So, because uh, if there was a way, I might do it myself. But, uh, uh, but the the last little dip that is is COVID. It's the COVID policies from 19. Because this is the tw this goes up to 20, data for 1920, which is data that we have not yet published. But it's uh, that last little thing there is that. Now the other one, the one before that, is the financial crisis and their policy reaction to the financial crisis is sort of, you see that in the U.S., uh, I guess I have a pun, that, that drop right there, that's the financial crisis. The U.S. dumped money out of helicopters to save the world. They, they, that's what they said. Uh, and but then this little dip here is COVID, the policy response to COVID. You see the U.S. response to COVID was pretty bad. It was actually bigger. But the world response, uh, you know, the world really didn't do much of a change in the financial crisis. The world average, or Israel and the world average, really didn't see, didn't see that. Um, but everywhere did the COVID thing. Yeah, so <clears throat> so um, I put that little Washington consensus there with roughly eight, 1980 to 2000. I, I would date that as the era we sometimes call the Washington consensus. If you don't like it, you're going to call it the era of neoliberalism. Neoliberalism is a, a, an ugly smear term that was invented by people who don't like economic freedom. Fine, they can use whatever words they want. Um, but this is the period that began with Reagan and Thatcher, but it's important to know that it wasn't just Reagan in the United States and Thatcher in the United Kingdom. This was a, they were riding a wave through the world of, of liberalization. It wasn't just England and the UK, or the United States and the UK. Um, it, it, this was the beginning of this long, drawn-out 20-year period of liberalization that, that, that was really infecting or affecting. If you don't like it, maybe you would say infecting. Uh, the whole world. <clears throat> okay, big picture there. Let's see. Now I want to remind you the five. Yes. Do you know what's happened in the year that the graph goes up in Israel? I mean, what is the reason? Uh, yeah, I don't know. I just look at forty. I, I know forty-two numbers. The numbers went up. Yeah, I don't know. So the when did the Luke, when did the Likud take over from the Labor Party? Okay, okay. <laughs> Okay. So I will say that when you see that kind of dramatic increase, you saw the same increase about the same time in New Zealand. Remember I said New Zealand and, and Israel were like the two countries that you thought of as being sort of modern, Western, like, you know, normal. Uh, and they were disastrous, like economic disasters, and it was always confusing. Um, both of them went bankrupt, or near bankrupt. And I know more about New Zealand, actually, than I know Israel. But, I mean, it, it, New Zealand was within a month of a national debt default. Now, it, Argentina's had like 10 of these. So Argentina would just default and say, screw you guys, and then go to the World Bank or IMF for more loans. But New Zealand, like, this is a real, like, a modern Western develop. Like for them to actually have a national debt default, they were not going to be able to make interest payments on their wow. on their debt. Uh, eighty six or seven somewhere in the late eighties, and they were like on the cliff of of an Argentinian like financial crisis, which again Argentina would just do because it's Tuesday and it's Argentina. They don't, but 
But, so New Zealand, though, what, they went right to that cliff and they, uh, they went, oh, man. And actually, it was the Labor Party in New Zealand that, that was the first one to begin to initiate the fiscal uh, re restraint and, and do the necessary hard political decisions. Yeah, so, and so sometimes it takes Nixon to go to China. Sometimes it takes the labor or the left-wing party to, to sort of initiate the, the move. So, um, so financial, the, the, right at the edge of an actual financial collapse, because uh, you know what happens, I mean, I don't know if you guys know this. If you default on your national debt, in a technical sense, every bank in your country fails. That's what it means. That's what, I mean, that's, so literally every bank account goes to zero, is essentially what happens, right? And, and for a country like Israel, uh, you know, or a country like New Zealand, this is just almost an unthinkable thing. So they got right up to the cliff, they looked across, and they decided not to jump, and they went back the other way. So, so same thing, I don't know the details in Israel, I just know it, it happened. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, you know, if you check the OECD countries, they have um, moved the same as yeah. Yeah, yeah, this is a global thing, it doesn't matter. This includes Africa, which really, didn't, you know. No, this is a complete, yeah, this would be true in Western Europe if I threw in, you know. That, this liberalization thing that hurt, happened in the 80s and, and 90s and Sweden did it, you know. Everyone did it, in different degrees. Israel's one of the ones and New Zealand's another one. There are some that really did it. But everybody, almost no one goes down in this period. Uh, Nicaragua went down in the 80s and 90s because they went socialist, but basically no one goes down. All right. So uh, just reminding you, the, the five big areas of the index, uh, size of government, property rights, money, monetary system, trade policy, international trade policy, and regulation, those are the five areas. So I've got an ugly graph now, a little ugly. It's not the worst graph I've ever seen, but it's not the cleanest either. Uh, this is the five area scores for Israel. Now, the, if I go backwards, that graph was from Ryan Murphy's new paper that's unpublished, and he's processed the data one way. One of the things he didn't do in his paper is do the areas. He didn't process the data at the area level, so I don't have his, his way of doing it. I've got a different set of data. It's been processed a different way, but I have it at the area level. So th there's, what I'm saying is there's not exactly a perfect match between the graph you just saw and this graph, but they're Kind of the same. Anyway, so just big picture again, you can see where Israel's five areas. I guess so the area summary is the red. Area one is blue. Uh, area two is black. Area three, that's money, is green. Um, that's because of the dollar, I guess, green dollars. Um, and then yellow is four. And then blue is, is light blue is area five. And you can kind of see they all start clustered between, you know, middle threes to six, and then they all more or less were drifting up. We're at the six to, six to nine range. So you can see that, you can see how the overall average is doing, is going up. It's pretty much everything, but it's interesting to look at the specific areas. So, um, <clears throat> so just again, red, this, again, these numbers don't perfectly correspond to Ryan's numbers from the previous graph, but same basic pattern. Red is the overall average. We start at four here, at 4.8, goes up to 7.363. Uh, so you're still seeing that same kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> let's look at area one. That's size of government. That's the dark blue line. The initial number is 4.32. The, the rating goes down. That means the government got bigger, right? So governments get bigger in the 70s. Uh, they start to get smaller around 1980. And uh, there's the dark blue line, dark blue line, dark blue line. And it's still a pretty big government here. Um, and I'll show you some detailed numbers in just a second. But it's obviously a, it's smaller than it was, say, in 1970. Okay, The fiscal size. We're talking about taxes and spending. Relative to the size of the economy, go Israel's government is smaller today than it was in 1970. Uh, some of this is a, de a denominator effect. Israel's economy has grown. And when you grow the denominator, the share of government spending as a share of the GDP or first, for example, will go down. But uh, <clears throat> so, so anyway, so we're seeing, okay, this, uh, that's what we're seeing. Uh, yeah. Quick question. Um, 
a few years ago, let's say three, four years ago, one of the main claims against uh, Benjamin Tanya was uh, you talk a lot about uh, liberal econo econo uh, economics, but you a lot of times do the opposite. And one of the specific things was the size of government, yeah. and his administration claimed that they're not higher or not significantly higher than the average of the OECD in terms of size of government. Well, uh, that might be true of the OECD. I'm not sure. I think that's probably... Yeah, you, you, yeah, you got Sweden and Norway and yeah, Finland and, 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 and so. But yeah, I don't, I don't have quick. Act. I do have it, but not, not in a quick way. So, um, I will. You'll, you'll take note though if you look at the five areas. Of course, one, the red area is the overall average. But if you look at the area three, area four, uh, area five. And then uh, that's one, and then that's area two. You know, of the five areas, the one area that's really lagging, one, well, two areas are lagging. One is the legal structure and property rights, and then the other one is the size of government. So relatively speaking, the size of government's the one that's lagging. Um, and, you know, the U.S. score here is like a 7.2. So you're well larger government than, say, the United States. But again, OECD is going to include mostly Western Europe. Um, green is money. And that's the big one, isn't it? It's the monetary policy. Oh, sorry. So let me do it in order, though. Area two is property rights. Not a lot of changes here, and you're not alone. Property rights is our measures of the, of the sort of efficient operation of the legal system. Um, very few countries see big growth or big regression here. Kind of is what it is. It's a really important area. Some people like to argue the area two is the most important area, but it's also what, the area that's hardest to change because you're talking about like how honest are the judges? Well, you already have a law that says judges have to be honest, right? I'm sure there's a law somewhere that says judges shall, must be honest. It's a crime for a judge to take a bribe, for example, right? I'm sure that you have that law. So you don't just change a law. If you have bad judges today, and I'm not saying Israeli judges are bad, but if you had bad judges, a law isn't going to fix it, right? They already have, every, every country in the world has the law that says you can't take bribes. So fixing, fixing the legal system, if it's bad, and yours isn't really great according to the data, it's about a, it's six, it's, it's about average. Um, it, it, fixing it's not a matter of just writing a law. You've got to change, like, culture. And that's really hard, and very few countries really see big movements in the area two score. Uh, and you're not alone there. The, the where? The, that's green. I'm talking about the black line right now, though. The black line starts at 6.22, ends at 6.08. Basically, flat. Nothing's going. Is that this legal framework? Is that also? Analyzing bureaucracy, how long it takes to get a verdict. <clears throat> yes, you know, one, of the, one of the measures is how long it takes to settle a contract dispute. It's mostly on the business contract side, not on the criminal law side. Is that like, is that like how long it takes to enlist the property? <laughs> yes, yes, we're using the same data. In fact, one of the variables is the how long it takes to transfer real property. Yeah, yes, sir. Do you see any country that had a big change in the uh, Well, the. Uh, <laughs> No, not, nothing jumps. I'm sure there are some, obviously there's gonna be some country that moved the most, but the country that moved the most objectively didn't move much. Now, I know that some did in a, in a real, like Georgia. Uh, Georgia had a really, really corrupt legal system. Their number for area two is still bad, but I know, but I don't have a number for the old Soviet Union, Georgia. And so I know it went from a two to a six, but I don't have the two, I just have the six now. Cause, so. So, yeah, yeah, you don't really get any of these numbers until the 90s, and that's already after the transition and, and most of the, yeah. You know, off the top of, the, off the top of your head, uh, area two score for Singapore? Oh, they're really high, super high, nine, nine, yeah. I mean, you take a bribe, they cut off your head. I mean, it's not... You spit on the sidewalk and they'll like hit you with a, uh, you know, I mean, if, if that's what they do to people who spit on the sidewalk, you know, you know what they're going to, yeah, no, it's it, Hong Kong too. Hong Kong's anti-corruption bureau is like the Gestapo. I mean, they just, they, they just, 
they, they prosecuted the former chief executive for a, like a $40, uh, he put like $40 on an expense report that he shouldn't have. And they prosecuted him, All right? I mean, this is so, the seriousness with which Singapore and Hong Kong take corruption is just off the charts. Now, they still have corruption there, but like relatively speaking, it's, you know, especially at the level of the basic courts. Why, why is that? Can, can all cultures do that or is that? Yeah, I, I tell you, you know, uh, I, I can tell you that the countries that I know that I think I know have really moved the most on that. I can't really measure it because it's hard to get the measures when they were really bad. It takes a level of brutality that I'm not sure most of us would be comfortable with. In Georgia, and I know I've written books about Georgia, so I know Georgia's process quite well. Uh, I mean, obviously, in Soviet times, corruption was just endemic. I mean, if you wanted your cable television hooked up, you had to pay a bribe. If you wanted your electricity hooked up, a, tel a telephone hooked up, everything, and these were all public utilities. If you wanted anything from the government, you had to pay a bribe to get it. The cops were criminals. The cops would, would shake people down. The, the new government that came in in 2005 cracked down, and they cracked down in a way that was, frankly, kind of almost a human rights abuse. I mean, literally, a, a cop takes a $25 bribe, and they send him to a Georgian prison for 50 years. And these kinds of actual, and of course, it did work. It worked. I mean, today's, like, Transparency International is a group that tracks corruption. It's a stupid survey. Georgia's actually really high on that now. And, like, how did they get so high? Well, the reason is they, they almost violated the Geneva Convention in terms of the severity of the, uh, and, and it didn't take, it, the, so I don't think most of us would be really comfortable with the actual methods that you have to use to go from a very low corruption place to a very, uh, very high corruption place to a low corruption place. I don't think most of us would be real comfortable with those methods because the methods are pretty brutal in Singapore and Hong Kong and in Georgia, the places that I think of as being the ones that did that. How high does China rank? Terrible. Yeah. Harold. Oh, a quick question. You talked about property rights. We had very, uh, very, very, uh, um, uh, um, um, very emotional uh, discussions in Israel about the property rights, but alleged violations in the West Bank. I'm talking about the Israeli courts. <coughs> yeah. The question was, when you talked about property rights and those stuff, did you look at West Bank data, yeah. in, be it Israeli courts or Israeli quasi-military courts and so sure. forth? Yeah, honestly, I don't know. We don't have the level of granularity in the data uh, for something that's really country specific. I am fairly confident, however, that you're not being penalized greatly in these data because of the whole Palestinian conflict. I, I don't see that. Uh, when they say we're measuring the, you know, the sort of, are the judges impartial? They're pretty much thinking, are they, are, if an Israeli is in an Israeli court, is, the, is it free, you know, fair? I think it's a pretty fair uh, number. There are a couple, um, Freedom House is a group in New York. They do political rights and civil liberties indexes. I don't use those indexes here. But um, they're generally f perceived as being fairly pro-Israeli. And uh, when I look at their scores, which usually correlate pretty well with our Area 2 scores, I think we see the same kind of thing. So I, I don't think it's, you know, the Palestinian problem and all the, 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 the conflict there you know, this is the area where that would really potentially pollute things. And it's possible, and this is a, so just as a thing, it's possible that you could say, for example, that, well, an Israeli might have a, a legal system that's a nine, but a Palestinian might have a legal system that's a two, so it averages out to be a six. And that's a possibility here. I think actually it's probably, a, they're measuring this just the Israeli side. Uh, this is a, the other country that reminds me of the sort of problem you have here with respect to, um, you know, the, the issues. Uh, is, is South Africa. I mean, South Africa essentially is two countries kind of concatenated on top of each other, you know, and it's very different to be a black South African than a white South African under apartheid, and, and arguably it's different today as well. And so the number you get for South Africa, you're like, what is this? Is this the white number or the black number? Or, you know, is this the Johannesburg number or the Cape Town? Because the country, we, got, we have this issue in a lot of other, in other countries as well. Uh, I'm pretty, f I don't think you're getting hit hard here, though. I think it's, you know, Okay, the big one, though, is the one you all were looking at, the green one, right? Uh, that's the monetary system, right? So starts out not terrible. Actually, <laughs> the best of them all, 1970, but 
in 19, in the seventies, you guys printed money like, and sp spent and sp printed money like drunken sailors on shore leave. And uh, what was the highest inflation rate, Bob? Anybody? Yeah, you, you hit you hit the thresholds that we start using the term hyperinflation. Uh, and at, again, I mentioned I was we made fun of Israel's economy back when I was a college student. Uh, and primarily it was because we heard about all oh, look at the inflation there. These people were, you know, yeah, we got like a little inflation here, but these guys are crazy, you know. So you see that we, we're showing that inflation era pretty strongly in the area three, as you should, uh, really a decline there. I mean, that number is below, that's a 1.5 or something. I mean, that's just, I mean, that's Venezuelan like monetary policy. And, but then of course, you hit, your, you hit the period where you were worried about a financial uh, collapse, uh, perhaps a default on the debt and so forth, and then you immediately reform. And then actually you've kept going up. Today, today you look just like the, most of the world, I, I pause because the world in the last year has maybe changed, but most of the world gets like high nines in area three now. Uh, I mean, inflation's been one to two to three percent pretty much in almost every country with only a handful of exceptions. Monetary policy is stabilized across the globe. So today, you guys, your best score is in area three. It's also historically the area you had the worst score. And, and the biggest single reason for your overall improvement in the index is clearly you, you had the, the, one of the globe's worst monetary policies. And now you have, you're tied with a lot of countries, though, for one of the best monetary policies. Um, so that's, that's the big one. And then the last is area five. Area five actually is an area that I, or four, no, area four, excuse me, trade. This is the area, though, where I was a little surprised. I kind of knew that Israel's economy was, um, <clears throat> the, the socialist ideology of the Zionist movement, the socialist ideology of the, of the early uh, Israeli uh, national governments, uh, not just in Israel, but Latin American uh, socialist movements, African social movements. The ideology of the day was to not trade with the outside world, to be self-sufficient. In what we call import substitution was the, the goal. So we're going to substitute <clears throat> with domestic, domestic production uh, for what we usually would import. We want to be <clears throat> do it ourselves. Uh, this is a recipe for poverty, by the way, if you know economics. But lots of countries wanted to pursue this low trade, minimal trade, do it yourself kind of model. Uh, and so, I mean, 3.43 is what that says right there. The area four, the legal structure number 3.43, that's ex just extraordinarily low. You had a, a, <coughs> essentially a closed economy, according to our data in the 70s. <coughs> and then, but you got on the, you got on the liberal, you got on the WTO or well, old number, old acronym was GATT, General Agreement for tariffs and trade. We used to call it the general agreement to talk and talk because it just, they just you know, went on forever. But over about 30 years, Israel and essentially most countries in the world began meeting, sending delegations to cool places like Rio and wherever, and they would party. And during the day, they would talk about how they liberalized, they could liberalize trade, and it worked. And now we have the WTO, that's the success, succeeding organization to the old GATT. Uh, and uh, I'm sure you guys are in the WTO. And just by being a member of the WTO, you, have, you, you are required as a member to, to liberalize your trade. Not completely, it's not free trade like I would like, but it's much better than it was. And so area, th area four is like an amazing one. 3.43 and then uh, eight point, that's 8.43, that's a five unit increase in area four in our index. Just for reference, it's a pure coincidence, but it's convenient. Um, one is about a standard deviation here. So that's a five sigma, in area four, that's a five sigma increase. <laughs> like in physics, you get Nobel prizes for five sigma discoveries, right? So whoever led the charge in Israel to open up the economy deserves a Nobel prize, an Israeli version of a Nobel prize, because that's an incredible increase. To go from a three to an eight is almost, I mean, it's like the Soviet countries did that, because, you know, Soviet, but it's really impressive. And I don't know if that's part of your national story or narrative or not, but it should be. Is that what the power? So, yeah. 
we don't have annual data back then, so it's all if, yeah. It's about 75, let's say. We call the economy an island economy. Yeah. Like New Zealand. Yeah, right. Exactly. So, um, what is that area? Area four. It's free trade, trade policy, trade policy. So if it's not part of your national narrative, it should be. Like we used to be closed and now we're open. And you know, an 8.43 in area two is a good score. Relatively speaking, you are an open economy. It could be more open. If I was in charge, it'd be more open. I'm not in charge. If Bob was in charge, I know it'd be more open. But it's pretty open. Okay. And then lastly is regulation. It's area five, and that's this light blue area line. It also starts out very bad. Like a lot of socialist economies, uh, Israel's economy was highly regulated, and it's now showing to be less regulated. The score is a 7.4. It's a couple, couple sigmas higher than it was before. Yeah. Do you know if the OECD measure of freedom economy or freedom um, country, you know, that they have the opportunity to open their market more than they have? Sure, but they're all going to be, they're all going to get kind of the same scores. Pretty much, if you're a compliant member of the WTO, you're going to get about the same scores, more or less. You know, a little higher, a little lower, because it's not just about trade policy. There's capital controls, which is not part of, of the WTO. And there's some other little things in, the, in Area 4 that aren't, strictly speaking, WTO-type data. But uh, more or less, if you're compliant with WTO, and not every country in the WTO actually is complying, but if, you, if you're sort of following the rules. Huh? Yeah, the U.S. is terrible. In fact, the U.S. score is below Israel's score in Area 4. We're like a six-something, so, so, yeah. <clears throat> okay, so, again, we're still kind of big picture. We're, getting, we're, we're starting big. We're going to drill down. <laughs> but it, as you drill down, it gets uglier and uglier, and the details, it gets harder. All right, so, but this is what Bob wanted me to do. We are now going into the weeds. There's the weeds. I told you it was the most boring book ever written, and this is what the book looks like. This is Israel's page. There's 165 pages that look just like this, and they're dense and they're ugly, and no one ever really reads it because it's stupid. Uh, it doesn't even, this is the book, it doesn't even include the, all the data. We actually only, we only have room for so much print. That's why we have graphs. So, hmm? That's why we have graphs. Right, this is why we have graphs. But I did want to look at some of the individual numbers, and so I blew this up a little bit. And I'm highlighting some of the areas where I was like, hmm, that's low. Overall, the story has been is pretty good for Israel. I mean, I think if I was if I was if I was you, I would want it to be like Singapore good numbers or, or U.S. or New Zealand type numbers. But it's not a terrible story. What's happened here? That doesn't mean you can just stop. You got to keep working. But the story's pretty positive, but when you look at the individual numbers, you'll see some like, oh, that's so, look at, look at this is area one's numbers, A, B, C, D, E, there's five parts of area one, uh, so this is the stuff I didn't show you the other day, but this is the actual data for area one, the variables, uh, A, B, C, D, and E, D actually has two parts to it, so there's, you know, it's like I said, it's averages of averages of averages of averages, um, and when I looked at area uh, one, two numbers really s s kind of jumped out. The overall score is 6.4. You got a pretty big government. Um, the U.S. number here is like 7.4, so, you know, something like that. So, uh, and I looked at the first one. This is government consumption, <clears throat> and this is not surprising, because I think I know enough about Israel to know about one thing. You probably spend a lot on your military. And... Military spending would be appearing in the government consumption variable. The second one is transfer spending. I don't think you have the world's most luxurious welfare state. So your area two number, or B, the B number is, eh, okay, it's normal. Uh, area one, though, 3.1 out of 10. That means you've got a really large amount of government spending on what we call government consumption. That would include normal operations of government, which would include the military. Education. And education, and just, just health. roads, health. health. Education is the biggest one. Yeah, no, uh, so education is the biggest one if you discount Mossad, Shabbat, and submarines, which go from the Prime Minister's office budget. So okay. if you include those, the security is a big bigger. But yeah. 
Oh, obviously, it is a little bit bigger, better than it was. I mean, in 1980, I got a, I got a 43% government consumption as a share of total consumption. That's a zero rating, and now it's 3.3. But 3.3, Sweden's number is better than that, people. Okay, so just, you know, when you think of the biggest government in the world, you probably think Sweden. Uh, Sweden's number is like a four, it's bad, but it's actually, I think, better. So you have a really big government, and there may be a really good reason for it, the, especially with the national security problem. So. I'm not judging your, the wisdom of your, your, your public policies. I am judging economic freedom. <laughs> and all I know is that Israeli citizens have to give their government a lot of money. And maybe it's for good reason. That's a separate question. But when you give the government money, you've lost the freedom to spend the money how you would have spent it. And that's just all I'm, that's what I'm measuring. And it, so we're not, when, when, I, when you go up or down on this index, it doesn't necessarily mean good or bad, it just means more or less freedom. And you may, in some cases, want to trade your freedom off for something else that you care about, like national security or safety or whatever. So, so you know, there's, there's arguments for why this is the way it is. But I'm just saying, in the world we live in, 3.1 is a really low score. Um, and I don't know if you could make your government any smaller safely. But if you could, your number would, would improve here. The other one is your marginal tax rate. Um, it's better than it was. We have a marginal tax rate of 66%. Uh, and then the one, so uh, the second one includes the payroll, the, a payroll tax, like a, a wage tax for usually for pensions, right? And uh, we didn't have it all the way back in time, but we have it now. <clears throat> so we're scoring a pretty high marginal tax rate for Israel. You get a five out of 10 in today's number. Um, the U.S. gets, I think, a six or seven out of ten. We're pretty high ourselves. Sweden gets a three because they get really high marginal tax rates. So, so this is about the top tax rate, and it's also about where it applies. So, if you had a 50% tax rate, but it didn't actually hit you until you had, uh, forgive me for not using shekels, but if you didn't, if you didn't, uh, if you, if your top 50% tax rate didn't apply until you were making a billion dollars a year, it really wouldn't matter. So, because no one makes a billion dollars a year, hardly, it'd be like three people or something. So, so, um, so this variable is based on both the rate and the income level at which it applies. And your 50% rate must apply at a level that's, A, that's a pretty high rate, but it also probably applies at a level that a fairly reasonable number of people actually do have them pay. Same thing in the United States. Our top rate is 43% at the national level and uh, can be higher at the state level if you add in the states, different states. Um, but it takes effect at like $200,000, it, it's, which lots of Americans hit, okay? So it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's an effect, it's a binding rate, yeah. The two these two variables, I mean, the tax and the government uh, consumption are quite dependent, no? Because if you have more money coming into the government, then it's bigger. Yeah, so, so we're mostly measuring government spending here, A, B, C, all government spending. Uh, e is, is about ownership of assets, like state-owned enterprises, which uh, aren't a huge deal here. Some, I guess, but not, not a huge deal. So, uh, sure, but the, the third area really isn't tax revenue, though. It's the rate. It's about the sort of the deadweight loss associated with taxes. So, we're really yes, of course, it's two sides of the same coin. You can measure size of government by the taxes or the spending. We prefer to do spending because I don't really care where the government got the money so much. You got it from deficits, you got it from borrowing, you still got the money. So to me, how the money, the source of revenue isn't terribly important. That's why mostly we're measuring the spending side. Yeah. Uh, two questions in Israel. Uh, we have uh, the, the, the Ministry of Treasury does this uh, small uh, trick that says, we basically have three income taxes, right? We each pay income tax and then social security and then health tax which are de facto income tax because they go yeah, from the so person to, there. to the government. So you got that? That's why we have so, so D double I, uh, this one. It's on there. That okay. includes that wage or health tax. And, and the other done. question regarding what you said about government expenditure, yeah. Israel is the single biggest recipient of the uh, U.S. Uh, civilian and military aid. I don't know in percentage of GDP, I'm assuming it's negligible, but my question is, Theoretically, yeah. if that isn't a loan and it's just a, a present, just money given in, 
would, would, would that theoretically have a chance of, um, of tweaking the number of the brick? Uh, no. Uh, and the reason is they get counted in transfers, and we, we actually are careful. It's, it's a stupid amount of work on our part. But we're careful to, to take out intergovernmental transfers. That would include intergovernmental transfers from abroad. So, uh, and there's only a few countries where it would really make a big difference, and this is probably one of the few that it would make a difference. But we do take that out. So that would be in B, though, and we net it out. So, because it's, it's a transfer, uh, yeah, it gets netted, yeah. Can you please explain about 1E? E? Yeah, 1E e is from the uh, variety of stock. It's basically, it's basically, how much of assets is owned by the government? This is going to include land. So the reason you're getting even, you're not getting a 10 here is almost certainly going to be because of land ownership by the government. Um, now, it's based on the value of the land, really. Uh, it's the value of assets that's owned by the government. And although I'm sure the government here owns a lot of valuable land, they also a lot of, own a lot of land that no one really wants. So the same, same is true in the United States. Um, so, but it's, it's, a, it's a number from a group called the Varieties of Democracy, and it has nothing to do with democracy, but it's what they call themselves. And uh, they have this score on, it's basically state ownership of the assets in the economy. In other countries, it would be, most countries that means land ownership, but it could also mean state-owned enterprises, if, you, if the state is running and operating lots of businesses, which I don't suspect is a huge deal here. I mean, we all have public utilities, though, and things that might be owned by the government. It's a relatively recent addition to the index, by the way. We didn't, have, we didn't have area E in the index until recently, until this data came online. But they have it back in time. Um, all right. Oops, wrong way. Sorry. I, oh, so there is one other thing. And I, I don't know. You guys might fight me on this. I'm just a messenger. Remember I mentioned the other day that we have gender legal rights adjustments now. And it's a, it's a battery of 17 different things that are tracked by the World Bank about differential, potential differential treatment of women in the legal system. And uh, it turns out that you don't get a perfect score there. So, it, and, and, and the US does, most of the OECD would get a one here. They, not, they get a .88, which means there's two of the 17 things where uh, you, you are getting ticked, and I don't know why, I don't know anything about this. You probably don't either. I'm just telling you that according to the World Bank, whoever the lawyers are at the World Bank who do this scoring, uh, what is it? Can a woman work in a job deemed dangerous in the same way as a man? They say no. And can a woman work in an industrial job in the same way as a man? They say no. I don't know what the specifics of that are. If you have a problem with it, if you have a problem with it, it's something at worldbank.com uh, <laughs> because so I don't know I mean I know that for example you 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 require women to enter the military so I was a little bit surprised that you don't get a perfect score um, but the military is not one job yeah, no, yeah. It's probably, it's probably yeah. maybe that's it okay it could be yes it could be I just don't know the details Literally all I know is I get 17 little zeros and ones from the World Bank. And you got two zeros and, and 15 ones. Um, it is what it is. Uh, honestly, this is one of those things where I get to punt. It's nice. I say, hey, you know, this is someone else's rating. Uh, if you have a problem with it, you got to talk to them. Um, and it could be that what you, some of you are saying, yeah, this seems reasonable because perhaps there's some gender-related issues in the security side of things. So I, I don't know. Okay. But you know, this is pretty easy to fix. I mean, the U.S. has a, we have got a big army too, and we, get, we don't have anything ticked, right? So I'm like, well, you know, I don't know. I, maybe you could get this fixed with a very small amount of effort, uh, or maybe not. I don't, I don't really know the details. It's, un, it's unfortunate. So here's a three and, and four. Nothing to really talk about in three, although historically, again, there'd be a lot to talk about three. But today, uh, your monetary system is... Okay, I think it's terrible. I think all monetary systems are terrible, but you're as good as it gets. And, what, and we, we kind of grade on the curve here. So as good as it gets, gets a nine. You're fine. Area four, though, uh, you have improved a lot, but I do so a couple issues. So four, B, I, non-tariff barriers. 
This is from the World Economic Forum survey, executive opinion survey. There is a question, the wording on the question is something like, in your country, how hard is it because of tariffs or non-tariffs to like trade? It's, it's a very broad question and you don't get a really good response there. And we call this non-tariff barriers, but it also does include tariffs. But I suspect if I land with a ship, a container ship at the port of Tel Aviv or whatever the port is, and I suspect Israel's customs agents are unusually diligent at their job. And I suspect that the, and maybe for good reason, okay? And I suspect that the people that are doing business across that port are complaining about it when they fill out that survey. Okay, again, there may be a good reason why you, your, your non-tariff barriers are higher than other places, but that's what they're saying. Um, the other one is capital controls. Get a 6.15. This is from the uh, IMF. The IMF lists, oh gosh, 13. Um, it's like the gender thing. There's 13 little boxes on this table that the world IMF publishes. And if you have that kind of capital control, it puts a dot. If it doesn't have that capital control, they, they leave it blank. I literally just count the number of dots and divide by the total. And so that basically means you've got about, you've got like six, so you've got like 40% of the, of the types of capital controls that you could have. Um, there are countries, lots of countries that actually get a 10 here. There are lots of countries in this world who get a perfect score in 4D double I. They get a 10 because they have none of the kinds of capital controls that the IMF is tracking on that table. You have 40% of those kinds. That's why you get a six. Uh, the US, by the way, is even worse than you. We have ki all kinds of capital controls. We didn't used to, but since 9-11, the US has gone crazy on capital controls because they're trying to fight the war on terrorism. I don't think they're winning that war, but uh, maybe they did, I don't know. So capital controls are rules and regulations about the flow of investment flows of, across countries. Okay, so if I want to buy a company in, if I want to invest in the Israeli stock market, that'd be a capital flow. If I want to buy a, uh, if I'm a foreigner and I want to buy a Israeli company, that's a capital flow. So direct and foreign direct investment, if I want to buy foreign financial investments like buying stocks or bonds. So, Lots of countries restrict and have all kinds of really complicated regulations, compliance regulations on the ability of foreigners to invest in, in a country. Um, and that's what the IMF is tracking. They also are doing it the other way, like can Israelis do foreign investment out or buy? They, so countries are restricting both inward bound capital and outward bound capital. And uh, you are doing quite a bit of that. Not, Crazy amounts, six isn't ter terrible, but you're doing quite a bit of that, according to the IMF. So, yeah, if we're talking about the war on terrorism, I guess that if America has something terrorism, I guess we are. Yeah, I suspect that, I mean, some of this is they're, they're putting really strict compliance rules on, <coughs> on financial flows because they're worried about some of those flows being used to finance bad people, right? So wait, so, till, uh, so from the FTFF start to work, and doing all this AML of contracts that all actually all the countries, the big countries in the world are signing on, because otherwise you cannot trade with the US. So yeah. actually the score of all those countries, which pretty much is the entire world, went down? I mean, so, so yes, yes. Okay. If you compare the ratings in this component today with, say, b before 9-11, more or less, um, Lots of countries have added capital controls. The other one was the financial crisis. So the, one of the reactions to the financial crisis, which was you know, the global financial crisis of 2007 and 2008, one of the reactions was government said, oh, well, the reason we had this crisis is because foreigners took their money out. So they wanted, this, they wanted to restrict the ability of foreigners to move money in and out to sort of stabilize, in their minds, stabilize the system. Again, some of these policies may be wise public policies, but I'm not measuring wise public policies. I'm measuring freedom. So can I move a money dollar in? If I, the answer is yes, then it's, you're free. If the answer is I got to fill out and hire 25 million lawyers and, and everything else, then it's, yeah. So, but yes, no, there's no question that this, this score has gotten worse. Most scores have gotten better over, over time, but this is one where the scores have gotten worse. The U.S. score was really gone down. I think we're a three now out of 10. And 
it used to be a nine or something. You know, we had one or two, but now we've got most of them. So, uh, I I should mention you get a perfect score on your freedom of foreigners to visit. This is tourist travel. You have a very good visa regime. I'm sure there are some restrictions, but you basically get a ten. Um, that's that means you're pretty open to foreign visitors. Tourism, I know, is a big business here, so it's not surprising that you would be. Free, uh, uh, every country in the world, though, took a big hit in, in 2020 because of COVID, but I suspect that number will go back up to your, whatever it belongs to be. Calculate how many countries, are there are countries you don't have diplomatic relations with, is that something? Yeah, there's a little bit of a, a fudge here, but, but yeah, so um, you, you, don't, you don't have to be literally completely 100% open to get a 10 here, so. <clears throat> and uh, last is regulations. Again, the overall score is pretty good, much better than it used to be. You can see the problem, though, backward in time, again, really visibly here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We only have seven numbers here for 1980. And now I've got, I don't know how many numbers, like a lot more numbers. So again, you have that apples and oranges problem. And that's why the earlier graphs, we've, we've, we've massaged the data to adjust for the apples to oranges problem. But these numbers are just the numbers. So there's a little bit of, of apples and oranges going on here. But if you look today's numbers, the current numbers we have, we get a 5.8 here for hiring and firing regulations, a 2.5 for mandated cost of, work, of worker dismissal. These are basically labor market regulations. So we're showing, relative to the rest of the world, a fairly high degree of labor market regulations here, particularly related to um, <clears throat> hiring and firing rules. I, I don't know what those rules are. Again, this, we're, sometimes I'm just the deliverer of what these other people are saying. All the numbers I'm using are other people's numbers. But these are coming from the World Bank's um, uh, doing business project. Of course, your conscription number is a zero out of 10. You have, you have a severe uh, conscription. We, we measure military conscription as a labor market regulation because it literally <laughs> it deprives you of your freedom to apply your labor where you would like to apply it, perhaps. Um, and so again, Milton Friedman himself, uh, I literally was in the room when Milton said, because we, we were discussing this index, 30 years ago, and Milton was there. And Milton said, I think, because he was an advocate for the volunteer army in the United States, as you probably know. And uh, he said, I'm against conscription. I think it's a violation of freedom. And then he said, but if, when I, was Isra if I was in Israel, I would support it. <laughs> uh, so again, it may be wise public policy for other reasons, like security, to have conscription. I don't, I'm not measuring that the wisdom of that trade-off. I'm simply saying, look, obviously, military conscription is the deprivation of your freedom to do with your life what you would like to do with your life for that period of time. So you get a zero out of 10. Um, and I don't know if that's, you know, it's just what it is. Other countries where it's not a zero or a 10? Oh yeah, so we do score it based on the length of service. Your length of service is also high. So uh, I think anything, what, how long is it? Three years. Three years. I think two years is our cut. Yeah, so I know. So it's it's two years. Anything that's two years or more gets a zero. If it's like I'm forgetting it, but it's close to something like uh, one to two years, you get a three, and less than one year, you get a five, and then if you don't have it at all, you get a, a ten. Something. It's, there's some kind of crude sort of gradation for length of service. We do not, there are a lot of countries that give you an option. Mexico is an example. Mexico gives you an option of doing some kind of civil service instead of military service. I'm sorry. I don't care where they're making you work. They're still making you work in something that you may not want to work in. So you don't, it, just because it seems like a little nicer not to make you go to the army and make you go, I don't know, help poor people in the villages or whatever they do. I don't know what they do. Uh, that doesn't matter to me. I mean, I, you're still, again, I'm about the freedom thing. So, uh, yeah. So, so, yeah, there are gradations, though. It's not crude, though. Yeah, <clears throat> You mentioned the doing business in that, uh, that was scrapped. Yeah. So I was just wondering if it's going to affect. Uh... So I'm using some stale numbers still. These are a couple years old numbers, although I still call them because I don't, I just update. Uh, the, two answers. One is I'm very hopeful that the doing business project is going to be resuscitated and kept alive by some other entity. So right now, my, I'm hoping that happens. And if it happens, then we can keep going. Uh, I literally today, in my inbox, in my email inbox, received a approved contract 
with the Economist Intelligence Unit, and they have a bunch of ratings that they do. They only do them for 80 countries, though. So I am now going to pay them an obscene amount of money to do all 165 countries. And their numbers include uh, several numbers that I think will be reasonable replacements for it. Three minutes in the next, are they going to scrap the whole project? Yeah, it's done. Going to stop? It's gone. The but whole thing. Said there, there's like something new in the works already, right? Yeah, well, the, 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 the previous organizers of that project are trying to convince someone on this earth to pick them up and reestablish the project. I think somebody probably will. But, uh, but the, the World Bank has pulled, the, they pushed the plunger. There's a third option. Actually, there's three options. One is it comes back in some other, with some other organization. The uh, second option is I use other data from another source and kind of, kind of find a way to mesh them. And then the third option is the World Bank is going to bring something back. It won't be the doing business project, but it'll be another kind of project. And that project, which is still a little bit up in the air about what that's going to look like. Uh, it's a couple years away, I'm sure. Okay. Can you comment on about why it was scrapped? And yeah, it was, I, and it was, um, I mean, was it a uh, justifiable decision to scrap it? Or? Yeah, I can. So the, the Doing Business Project by the World Bank began in the 90s. It was a project of a guy named Semyon Dejankov, a Bulgarian-American economist. He um, convinced them to do this project that measures how many days it takes to start a business, how many days it takes to settle a contract dispute, how many... How costly is it to transfer property? Did these amazing measures for only the World Bank would have the resources to do this kind of project, and at the time anyway. And it's a great project. We almost immediately began using their numbers in our index. They're really, really happy with them. Uh, it, it, it's a World Bank project. It was quite prominent. It got a lot of headlines, and it was embarrassing to lots of national governments. There were early, some of the early reports, like the Egyptian government they, were, they reported that it took like 375 days to, to get a construction permit. <laughs> you know, it was like a year and a half or something to get a And it was embarrassing. And lots of governments reacted in the way I hoped they would react by making it easier to get a construction permit. But some of them just complained, China being one of them. And so the, 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 the scandal that erupted a couple years ago was that China was pressuring the World Bank to change or massage or uh, do, you know, play games, while the senior leadership of the World Bank, by that I mean literally the president of the bank and the senior vice president, you know, like the, the really high end, they were lobbying the Chinese government for more support for the World Bank, because the World Bank is, basically lives on donations from national governments. And so they wanted China to contribute more to the World Bank. China was not happy with their doing business scores. And there was some pressure maybe it's a little opaque exactly how this happened, but there was some pressure on staff members to maybe boost China's numbers. That's the story, that's the scandal, was that China essentially pressured the World Bank to change their World Bank numbers. There's not a lot of, there's not a lot of fire, but there's plenty of smoke in the story. Like there's some, you know, okay? Now, here's my, I would be really pissed by the way. I'm a professional researcher, it's my job. I would be really angry if my boss came to me and asked me to change a number. I'd be pissed too. I, I, feel, I really feel for the World Bank staffers who were, felt like they were being pressured by their senior leadership. Um, but here's the thing, in the year in question, the year that they say this was going on, China's overall score in the Doing Business Project went from 73rd to 65th. Okay, it went up. It, it, you know, and I looked at the, the there's nine, thing, nine areas of the Doing Business Project. Like seven of the nine areas didn't move at all. And like, well, okay. I mean, I'm not saying this is nothing, but it's not a lot. Whatever corruption was going on between China and the World Bank and the New Bank was a, should have been dealt with, because I'd be pissed too. But it's not a huge thing, especially when you compare it to the good that this project's doing in other, other dimensions. Um, so that's, I, A, it wasn't a big deal, frankly. I don't think it was a big deal. It was a big deal. If I was that researcher, I'd be really mad. But it, like, globally speaking, it's not a big deal for the project. It could, be, it could have been fixed much easier with just fixing that problem. The second thing, I think this was pure politics. Within the World Bank, 
you might not be surprised to hear this. There are a lot of left-wing ideologues in the World Bank. The World Bank is not a hotbed of neoliberalism. <laughs> there are a lot of big government, borderline socialist people working at the World Bank. That's what they want to see. Governments get bigger, more powerful. They, that's their worldview. And they have hated this project since the day it was created. Because this was this neoliberal camel's nose under the tent, right? And they, were, and they hated it. The ILL, the UN's International Labor Organization, has made it a, their personal mission to attack the, the Doing Business Project. Because those numbers right there, what I'm going to talk about right now, the labor market numbers. Because the, the Doing Business Project was, was advocating for more open and liberal, and, you know, liberal in the correct sense, uh, labor markets. And the ILO is exactly against open and liberal labor markets. They want regulated labor markets. So the ILO at the UN, a very powerful international organization, has been attacking the World Bank's doing business. So I really think what happened is the China thing was real, but that was the, that was the leverage, the excuse that the, 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 the 20 years worth of, of opponents of the, of the doing business project, they used that, they lashed on that as, as the excuse to get rid of it. There's a second dimension. The, a point that when this went down, it was uh, whoever was in charge of the World Bank was, um, I forget the name, but when the scandal broke, yeah, I can't remember, but when the scandal broke, it was a Trump appointee who was the president of the World Bank. And of course, Trump is at this time doing everything he can to poke China. So another thing, so there's two things. Ideological opponents inside the bank and outside of the bank hate the World Bank, hate this doing business project. And then the Trump administration saw this as an opportunity to make an embarrassing headline for China. That's what I think happened. Uh, so, again, I, I, I do. Also, is, yeah. is that, you know, even if you can, even if somebody can replace this, it won't have the same prestige as the World, World Bank's. Uh, That's true. Index. Perhaps. Depends on who takes it over. I mean, as much as I admire the economists, they won't be able to replace. Uh... Yeah, no, the economist doesn't have the resources. Well, I'm, I was hopeful like something like LSE or somebody would take it over. Somebody pra fairly prestigious. They're shopping, but they're shopping it literally as we speak. It's about a $3 million a year price tag, though, so it's, it's a big deal. It's a lot of money. Um, the other area, and I think we got a hint of that yesterday at the winery, this last one. Uh, administrative requirements. This is some data from a consulting firm called IHS Group or something. And it's basically a score that they give for countries on how costly and difficult it is to work with the bureaucracy. Uh, the winery story about the, you know, is pr pr precisely the kind of story that's in my head already about why that might be the case. But a 4.2 there is pretty low. Um, uh, so, generally speaking, your regulatory measures are not that bad, but the one of them that we use is pretty bad. So, there's at least some evidence that the regulatory system here is a little cumbersome. Um, some evidence that it's not. Some of the other scores aren't too bad. It's not too hard to start a business here, according to the World Bank, the now discontinued World Bank data, but, um, yeah, somebody had a hand, I saw. Okay. All right. So, yeah, sorry. Okay. No? I, I was just I'm going to ask an overall question. I don't know what time it is. Yeah, uh, fifteen. No, I mean, just finish this. I'll ask my question later. Okay. Because I was asking, so kind of like, what would be your prescription for Israel to go from like a forty something where they are to well, the top ten? I mean, consider under the constraint that they have right. the need for. High investment in defense. Um, but you can respond to this. Yeah, that's a good question. I really don't know. I mean, I know technically, get rid of conscription, go from a zero to a 10, that'll do a lot for your index score. I'm not sure that you want to do that, but you know. So under the constraint you just gave me, it, maybe this is as good as it gets. We have more and more voices in Israel about uh, eliminating the uh, right. uh, compulsory yeah, conscription altogether or so, almost altogether? Or reducing the length, or I don't know. I mean, there's, there's, there are yeah, ways to... Reducing, reducing, and, and also we have, by the way, professional... This is a huge, huge subject to talk about for days, but we had three big committees, all headed by a very senior ex uh, 
Israeli army officers, the Air Force, and so forth and so on. The local committee was the last one, but, but not the only one. And they all basically said, in, 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 in very uh, euphemism ways, because you can't say uh, eliminate the uh, mandatory uh, army in Israel, because that's like a third rail kind of thing. Uh, they all said we should uh, shorten the mandatory one, and we should pinpoint the people we want, and we should get them into career military very soon. Right, and yeah. they all said it in very various ways. Yeah, that's yeah. been that, that's being, like that's what Russia was trying to do. I don't think it's worked very well, but that's been. <laughs> <laughs> you well. can, I mean, just using economics, you can, you you, you can kind of wonder what kind, uh, what kind of uh, product or efficient result or results you're getting when the when the uh, when you have conscription as opposed to a well-trained military, uh, so you could, I mean, this is what the U.S. Yeah. did, right? Um, arguably, you guys have different national security problems, but considering how neocon and hawkish the U.S. is, they need to project also enormous strength. So it seems to have worked with them, assuming for them, assuming that uh, that that it's uh, that it's really working but uh, but the other thing is like it's also could be that the mandatory the, the compulsion actually does there's a byproduct in terms of uh, you guys like maybe what you're learning through those three years kind of adds to who you are and by that I don't know how we would measure it right one thing I do know is that it's not cheaper conscription is not cheaper it's more expensive it just appears cheaper because you're pushing the cost off onto people's, and we don't, we don't have that on accounting sheets, but it's not cheaper. If you take a doctor like my friend Udi and put him in the Israeli Air Force, that's an awfully expensive piece of labor. Uh, that wasn't cheaper. Uh, that was more expensive. But it, it appear, to the government, it appears cheaper, cause, yeah, but it's, it's, not, military it's military. not cheaper. So that's all military reserves would probably cost a lot of money to the government yeah. for each day of work they're paying exactly at the market. And, right. <laughs> so, yeah. You know, since our biggest government expenses are health and education, we can adopt the American education and health model. And right. Yeah, I mean, so there probably are, there are probably margins where you could save. I wouldn't adopt our health model if you want to save money, by the way. Right. No, I don't know that I would adopt the American model for exactly, a exactly. but uh, that's what I'm saying. So. And by the way, speaking of, uh, just what you asked about boosting up the scores, even if we disregard the national security thing altogether, Israel can boost up the scores to more like that. They could say, we're zeroing the quotas and the tariffs about agricultural products. Israel is in, a, is, is in a very bad way uh, statistically. It's a very statistical outlier in the bad sense of, agri of imports yeah. and exports of agricultural products. Yeah. Mostly, mostly so raw products. I had two pieces of research, uh, but we ended up with the earlier pre presentation up here, so the one's not in there. But two pieces of research that I just wanted to touch on because there's, they're Israeli and economic freedom specific. The first one is a paper I wrote called the Hayek Friedman Hypothesis about economic and political freedom. I'm a lot with Bob here. I really don't care that much about political freedom. I care about economic freedom, but other people care about political freedom. And this is that two by two that a couple of the students were talking about the other day. If you think about the world we live in, if you think about democracy on the one hand and capitalism on the other, to use the crude, crudest terms, there are lots of countries that have capitalism, economic freedom, and democracy, like the US, lots of countries here. There are lots of countries that have neither, like the old USSR, but today you know, Venezuela has neither a democracy nor economic freedom. So there are plenty of places that have that are liberal both politically in terms of democracy and liberal in terms of their economic systems, and then lots of countries that are illiberal in both dimensions. There are also countries that are, in this, this one, that are economically free. That is to say they've got something like capitalism running the, the economy, but they're not really liberal democracies. China, uh, not China so much, but Hong Kong for sure, uh, Singapore is an authoritarian state. It's not the Soviet Union, but it's not a democracy either. Uh, the oil rich, um, not Saudi, but, but you know, United Arab Emirates and Kuwait um, would be capitalist countries in terms of economics, but not political, literally liberal. So there are 
fair number of examples down there. The, the really point that Friedman and, and F.A. Hayek were, were worried about was that upper left quadrant is what about countries that want to be democratic socialists? They want to be democracies, liberal political systems, but illiberal economic systems. And Hayek and Friedman says that's a no-go land. You should not, that can't happen, or at least it can't last very long. And, and yet, it, um, Israel is an example of a country, and this is, the, this is the data look of that two-by-two two matrix. This is the, so same kind of thing. Political freedom is on the vertical, and the horizontal is the economic freedom. And where was Israel in the 70s and 80s? Well, we know where they were in economic freedom. We just saw that data. They were terrible, right? They were very low in economic freedom. Um, laughing stock, not capitalist, basically socialist as an economy. And that's why they're well to the left on the, the left-right scale there. But was it a democracy in the 70s? Yes. Yeah, yeah, no shortage of newspapers and radios and political parties. I know the Labor Party dominated, but it, you had a competitive party system. And so you had pretty good political freedom scores, right? So you were in that upper left quadrant. You had something you could have called democratic socialism. Of course, what happened? The Israeli economy was a disaster because socialism is a bad economic system. Um, so the economy went bad. And at some point, what had to happen? Something had to give, right? And what gave in Israel? The economic system gave, right? They changed the economic system away from socialism towards something more like capitalism. Uh, my paper stopped in 2005. It's a little bit of an old paper. But today, you're up in that upper right quadrant. You're up there with the, the, the sort of normal countries, right? So my, this paper was just basically looking at different, different combinations of countries and where they were. And Israel is one of the few that, that tried to be in that upper left quadrant, and, but it didn't survive. Yeah. Similar? Yeah, India's would look similar, except India's movement to economic freedom has been not nearly as much. Like, they barely have gotten to the halfway point. So they move, but it's not as dramatic, so it's not as cool. What about Sweden? Yeah, but Sweden's always been up there. They've never been low on economic freedom. So, yeah. Yes? How do you choose to put the line between socialists? It's, it's, a, it's a continuum. So that vertical line is just the average. So it's five, the, the line in the middle would be five? More or less. It's closer to six, actually. It's not really good. What about Chile under um, Pinochet regime? Pinochet goes down here. That's down here, though. Right? So Chile was down here under Pinochet. And then after the democratic reforms, they went up here. OK? Remember, though, we don't really. We weren't really interested in that bottom quadrant. We're, I'm interested in it, but not, not Hayek and Friedman weren't talking about that problem. They were talking about the upper left quadrant, not the lower right quadrant. The lower yeah. right quadrant can, you give in, can you give insight on why exactly? Well, I, I, well, I can tell you it doesn't. Let me, let me answer that in a different way. It doesn't have to go that way. There's another country, Venezuela, that they started, in, they started in the upper right with fairly liberal economic system and a fairly liberal political system. But then they decided to go socialist, so they went to that upper left quadrant. But then the economy fell apart, because I don't know if you know this yet, but socialism is a really bad economic system. It, it doesn't perform well. It doesn't produce growth and prosperity. It doesn't. So in, in, so in Israel, you adopted socialism, you had a democracy, you had socialism, the economy performs poorly. In, at least in the 90s there, or early 90s especially, Venezuela had democratic socialism. The economy doesn't perform well, but they still had their democracy. And then what happened? Something had to give. They gave up their democracy to keep their socialism. They, hired, they, they elected Chavez in a free and fair election, but he got rid of the democracy. So now they're in the bottom, they're now down there like the Soviet Union. So the point is, the argument that Hayek and Friedman were making, very famous arguments in The Road to Serfdom and Capitalism and Freedom, was that that upper left-hand quadrant is, a, is sort of a, you can go there, but it's not going to work. Why Israel didn't do Venezuela and why Venezuela didn't do Israel is a really interesting question. I mean, what were the political dynamics going on? Uh, that's a really interesting question I don't have an answer for. That was your question. I don't really have an answer, but it's really interesting to think about why 
you know, there are only a few countries that really try to do this. India is one, but they're, and they've moved towards capitalism. They've moved away from, not as dramatically, but they have. Would Lebanon look like this? I don't know. I don't have enough data for them. I, I don't have enough data for them. I don't, yeah. Yeah. So looking generally about the 156 uh, countries that you measure, what about the, the Scandinavian uh, countries? They're always in the upper right because they're always liberal democracies and they've never been really socialist. Never, never, never. Not, not even once. So, I mean, if you think about our index, not a single one of those countries has, has been yellow or red in the map, never. They're always above average, and some of them are really well above, like Denmark is in the top 10. So, yeah, they got a very big government. So area one is bad. <laughs> area one is terrible. But area two is like 9.5, area three is 9.5, area four, free trade, Denmark is like really. And so, unions and stuff, hmm? where it gets into the with unions. Unions, so, the one, so there's two areas where they really will get hurt. Area one, which is government size, and then 5B, the labor market part. But that's only, you know, you know 20 something percent, 25 percent of the index. Um, so that, that paper's cool. I, I love this paper. It's one of my favorite papers I've ever written. Um, God, why, why might you care about this thesis? Well, it turns out they're not, I care about economic freedom. I'm a libertarian. I like capitalism. That's what I, democracy's nice. I'm using it right now, like literally free speech as I, as, you know. I like it. I'd rather have democracy than not, but I really want capitalism. But there are a lot of people out there that don't care about capitalism. They don't care at all. All they care about is democracy, 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 democracy. Well, that's why this thesis matters. Because if you only cared about democracy, the thesis says you have to have at least some economic freedom. You can't have democratic socialism. You can only have democratic capitalism. That's what Friedman and Hayek were arguing. And so even if you weren't a kind of economic libertarian, and you were just a small d Democrat, we have to say small d Democrat to me, not the Democratic Party, right? Um, if you were just a small d Democrat, my argument is, and Hayek and Friedman's argument is, that you still should support at least mostly capitalism, because only within that system, to use exactly the phrase that, that Hayek used, only within that system is democracy possible. So that's why the thesis is important. I think it's more, uh, in my case, I'm thinking that this is a way to reach across the aisle to people who don't necessarily have an affinity for liberal markets. And this is a way for me to argue with them that, hey, look, I know you don't care about liberal markets. I know you really only care about liberal democracy. But the only way you're going to get liberal democracy is if you adopt at least some kind of liberal market. It doesn't have to be the libertarian nirvana that I would prefer, but at least something like, like that. And so that's why this argument, I think, is worth, worth making. Let me t tell you, just, we're going to run out of time in a minute. I want to tell you about the other piece of research, and I will make sure that I send it to whoever, Ananel or somebody. Um, ben Powell's got a paper about the immigration wave in Israel in the, in the 90s. As you might know, this population of Israel went up by 20%, almost entirely based on Soviet Jewish immigration. Right? Uh, there is no country on earth that probably over a shorter period of time, as short a period of time, saw an influx of immigrants like Israel saw. We're ahead of the South. And, of the country, yeah, and of course, uh, and one of the big debates in the United States is like, what would happen if we liberalized our immigration system? Because if we liberalize our immigration system, we could do that. I mean, without any effort on the United States' part, we could invite on this planet, there are hundreds of millions of people that would like to move to the United States, right? So if we liberalize our, our system, we, would, we know that we would get a huge influx. And the big debate is, well, what would happen if that came to pass? Well, I don't really know, but I know one country that had something like that happen, and that's Israel. And they look at the effect of, the, effect of the immigrant wave uh, in Israel uh, on economic freedom. And the answer is, actually, the answer, their paper says, it's done with a synthetic control model, it's a really cool model. Their paper says that Israel's economic freedom today is higher 
than you would have predicted because of the immigrants. <laughs> Okay, fine. Very, 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 very this is a case study, and the problem with all case studies is how generalizable they are. You are highly educated. Sure. So, part of them moved to the U.S. and they got accepted. The, the, in the paper, they mentioned all of these caveats. The people that came saw the hardships of uh, dictatorship socialism. That's a very specific cohort. I, you are 100% correct. Everything you say is correct. And Ben and, ben and his co-author address all this. Um, they also have a paper for Jordan. Jordan in the 90s, early 90s, because of the Kuwait War and also some of the issues here, saw an influx, not as dramatic. I think it was about 10% of the population of Georgia, Jordan increased in a few, just a short period of time. They had a 10% increase in population that was driven by immigrants. And they weren't high educated Soviet Jews. <laughs> they were poor Arabs from different places. And the same, th same thing happened, though. The, the, the Jordan was not, the economic freedom in Jordan appears to be better today because, so case studies are, are instructive to an extent, but obviously every case study is a case study for a reason. They're different, and you can't really, I wouldn't draw from, from Israel's experience necessarily for the US, but we don't have very many examples in, in the world of massive immigration waves where we've got data. So, yeah, I, I, I think we need, you're going to have to ask, to do the research on this, you need to wait 10 years. There's, there's really a, a potentially interesting implication if, it, if the United States did that. Because actually, there is a, a point in immigration law history that really had a great impact on what happened in Israel. Because what happened in the United States is until 1924, Immigration was completely open, yeah. and Jews from Europe were flowing into the United States. In 1924, they changed the immigration law, very, and very much racial, racially motivated, yeah. and they slammed the door shut. When, the, when they slammed the door shut in the United States in 1924, there were waves of Jews who would have gone to the United States who did, who came here, and there was great growth in, in the Jewish population in Israel, I think very much as a result of them slamming the door in 1924 in the United States. Now, if they completely open the door now in the United States, there's an yeah. interesting question about yeah. what the implication of that would be here. Yeah, Ben, one of the really interesting, I didn't know anything about the, the Russian immigration to, the, to, the, to Israel, but one of the really interesting things in the paper that I learned was how, frankly, they wanted out of Russia more than they wanted to go to Israel, right? It wasn't so much, it, it, was, it was push, not pull. And the, re, the fact is, if you were a Soviet Jew, you could, it was easy to go to Israel. You have the, you know, the law. So it wasn't so easy to go to the United States. So, um, so it, it wasn't like they, were, they had a real affinity for Israel as such. They have surveys of, of these immigrants. You know, if you could have gone to another country, would you have gone? And the answer was, 75% said, yeah, I would have gone to some other country. This was just the easiest place to go. So, I mean, these were people, I mean, yeah, they were well-educated and, and stuff, but they were not really, they weren't Zionists. They weren't coming to build the homeland. They were getting out of Russia. We're also very poor, so, and there were also a yeah, lot of um, yeah. immigrants from Ethiopia in those years. Yeah, and, so, so, yeah, 75% were Soviets. Yeah, were Soviets. yeah, yeah. So anyway, it's a really interesting paper. I think if I was an Israeli like you are, yeah, and uh, I would be interested in this. It's a very high piece of scholarship. It's well done. It's 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 like sophisticated, um, and it's it's about economic freedom and immigration, which is kind of an interesting topic. So uh, I wanted to make you aware of that paper. I'll make sure that I share it with the organizers. So if you're interested, you can get it from them. Um, Google works too. It's if you Google Ben Powell Israel, you'll find the paper. But it's you know, uh, it's a fun paper. I, I really uh, I really do think it's it's well done. How much of a lesson it is for the United States, is, I don't know, but at least it's interesting if I was just on Israeli, on just Israel's, Israel's terms alone, it's an interesting paper. So, so I, I wanted to mention those two pieces of scholarship, because it's the only two pieces of scholarship that I knew that dealt with economic freedom and Israel in a scholarly way, and those were the two. So.